just a few examples of their many contributions to the BGU community include the Kreitman Plaza, the Kreitman Building, the Kreitman School of Advanced Graduate Studies, and the Kreitman Foundation Scholarships. It's through the vision and support of Irene and Hyman Kreitman that so many students have been successful in fulfilling their goals here at BGU. Today, a wide variety of social action projects, student activities, and facilities have been made possible through the generous contributions of the Kreitman family. We remember Irene and Hyman Kreitman here today with this annual lecture, which is held in their memory. Now, the Right Honorable Sir Martin Gilbert really needs no introduction from me. But as a fellow Brit, and as Sir Martin was my tutor in international relations many, many years ago, in fact, in the middle of the last century at Oxford, I'm particularly pleased to have the honor to introduce him this afternoon. Sir Martin was born in London in 1936. After school in London, he did his national service. That's the equivalent here to military service in Sahel, which in those days was compulsory in England, and in which he served in the Intelligence Corps before going up to Magdalen College, Oxford, where he read history. After graduating in 1960, he went as a research scholar to St. Anthony's College, Oxford, and in 1961 he was elected a junior research fellow at Merton College, Oxford. Soon afterwards, Winston Churchill's son, Randolph, asked him to join his research team working on the life of his father. And for the next few years, he combined working on the Churchill archives and teaching at Merton. In 1968, after Randolph's death, he became the official biographer of Sir Winston Churchill. Given the significance of Churchill's role in British, and for that matter, world history, this was a tremendous accolade and recognition to bestow on a man so young in years. He's written six volumes of Churchill biography, 12 volumes of Churchill documents, and much else on Churchill and on the First and Second World Wars. I'm sure that in every generation, new Churchill biographies will be written, but Martin's magnificent corpus will never be shunted aside and will always have to be the basis of further reinterpretations. He's also written widely on the British government's policy of appeasement in the 1920s and 1930s, and has compiled a three-volume history of the 20th century. He devised and published a great number of historical atlases on the First and Second World Wars, British, Jewish, and Israeli history, the Holocaust, on an, and on many other topics. He has, of course, written extensively on Zionism and on Israeli and Jewish history generally, and, of course, on the Shoah. His book, The Holocaust, The Jewish Tragedy, published in the U.S. as the Holocaust, A History of the Jews of Europe during the Second World War, is a classic work on the subject. All in all, he's written over 80 books. Martin, I must say, your phenomenal output is really simply daunting. He's made special studies of the Dardanelle Commission of Inquiry and the Royal Commission on Palestine, the Peel Commission. He is considered one of Britain's leading historians. He was knighted in 1995, having spent two years advising British Prime Minister John Major. This included, included accompanying him during official visits to Washington, Jerusalem, Gaza, and Amman. Sir Martin has also advised three other British Prime Ministers, Harold Wilson, Margaret Thatcher, and Gordon Brown. He's lectured widely all over the world, from the White House to the Kremlin, on political and military history and international affairs. And here in Israel, he's taught at both Tel Aviv University and the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He appears frequently on TV and broadcasts on the radio. At the end of July 2009, Sir Martin was made a privy councillor and asked to be a member of the official committee of inquiry launched by the British government into the UK's involvement in Iraq including the way decisions were made 
and actions taken and to establish as accurately as possible what happened and to identify the lessons that can be learned. His work on the Iraq Committee of Inquiry brings to mind what Churchill said about politicians. A politician needs the ability to foretell what is going to happen tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, and to have the ability afterwards to explain why it didn't happen. But Churchill was much more than a politician. He was, of course, a world statesman and a historian. And he made history in his own right. He's also, he's also quoted as saying, the further backward you can look, the, for, the further forward you are likely to see. And that's why Sir Martin is such an appropriate choice for today's lecture entitled Sowing the Seeds of Jewish Statehood, Britain and Palestine, 1909 to 1922. Sir Martin. Well, Madam President, Harold, my former pupil, and a particular greeting to Professor Isaiah Friedman, who is the, the dean of the subject on which I'm going to say a few words this afternoon. It's an honor to be asked to give the ninth Irene and Hyman Kreitman Memorial Lecture. I was fortunate to have known the Kreitmans and to have had a great respect for them Indeed, their family sponsored my very first lecture here in Israel 41 years ago. <clears throat> the topic I've chosen for this afternoon is sowing the seeds of Jewish statehood, Britain and Palestine, 1909 to 1922. Why 1909? While traveling that year in the Galilee, a young Oxford archaeological student, T. Lawrence, later better known to us as Lawrence of Arabia, reflected on the glory days of the region in Roman times and on the new Jewish farm settlements that he saw on his travels. Writing home on the 2nd of August 1909 about the Roman times, I quote, Palestine was a decent country then and could so easily be made so again. The sooner the Jews farm it all, the better. Their colonies are the bright spots in the desert. A mere eight years after Lawrence's enthusiastic comment, Britain issued the Balfour Declaration in favor of the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. When in 1922, the League of Nations accepted the terms of Britain's mandate for Palestine, it gave prominence to the Balfour Declaration. The mandatory should be responsible, the League of Nations preamble stated, for putting into effect the declaration originally made on November the 2nd, 1917, by the government of His Britannic Majesty in favor of the establishment of a national home for the Jewish people. Indeed, the preamble of the mandate included the complete wording of the Balfour Declaration, including that the British government would use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of the Jewish national home in Palestine. How had the Balfour Declaration come to pass? I remember David Ben-Gurion quizzing me about this in his home at Sidi Beaucaire in 1971, as did Harold Paisner earlier today. In the autumn, of 1917. As September turned into October, Britain was in a desperate situation on both the Western and Eastern fronts. 
in its then three-year-long war against Germany, Austria-Hungary, and Turkey. On the Western Front, the Battle of Third Ypres, culminating in the struggle for the village of Passchendaele, was proving a bloodletting disaster, and the hopeful breakthrough which had eluded the British armies in 1915 and 16 was clearly going to elude them at even greater cost in 1917. <clears throat> in the East, the Russian army, Britain's essential ally, was crumbling under the persistent efforts of Bolshevik propaganda. A way forward for Britain, a way in which Britain might avert defeat at the hands of Germany, was suggested that autumn in London by the Zionist leaders who were then there. Chaim Weizmann, Vladimir Jabotinsky, Nachum Sokolov, and Yechiel Chlenov, the four giants of the movement. And with them in London that autumn was Aaron Aronson, who had just made his way with great difficulty to London from Palestine. The pioneer farmer and member of the Lilly Group, whose spies were enabling the British Army to move from the disasters at Gaza here to Beersheba and on to Jerusalem. Weizmann, Jabotinsky, Sokolov, Chlenov, and Aronson told their British political contacts, who were at the very center of British policy making in the Foreign Office and in the Cabinet Secretariat, that if something could be done to give the Russian Jews the prospect of a Jewish national homeland in Palestine, a homeland that would be dependent upon the defeat of Germany and Turkey, then those Russian Jews would become keen and vocal supporters of Russia remaining at war. The United States was also an ally of Britain, but had yet to make a significant contribution on the battlefield. Weizmann, Jabotinsky, Sokolov, Slenov, and Aronson insisted to their British interlocutors that the prospect of a Jewish national homeland in Palestine would also encourage American Jews, especially those who were recent immigrants from Russia, to enlist and to fight. Many were to do so in British units that fought against the Turks here. Rabin's father was one of those volunteers. To win the support of Russian and American Jews, those British civil servants and diplomats, including the British ambassador in St. Petersburg, who were advising the War Cabinet and the Foreign Office, and the Foreign Secretary, A.J. Balfour, encouraged offering at least the possibility of an eventual Jewish majority in Palestine, even if, with the settled population of Palestine then being some 600,000 Arabs and 60,000 Jews, it might be many years before such a majority emerged. On the 31st of October, 1917, Balfour told the War Cabinet that while I quote the words national home do not necessarily involve the early establishment of an independent Jewish state, such a state was a matter for gradual development in accordance with the ordinary laws of political evolution. How these ordinary laws of political evolution were to be regarded was explained in a Foreign Office memorandum on the 19th of December, 1917, by Arnold Toynbee, an expert on the Near East, and Louis Namia, a Galician-born Jew who was active as a member of Dr. Weizmann's inner circle. 
Toynbee and Namir wrote jointly, the objection raised against the Jews being given exclusive political rights in Palestine on the basis that it would be undemocratic with regard to the local Christian and Mohammedan population is certainly the most important which the anti-Zionists have hitherto raised. But the difficulty is imaginary. Palestine might be held in trust by Great Britain or America until there was a sufficient population in the country fit to govern it on European lines. Then no undemocratic restrictions of the kind suggested would be required any longer. And this was to become the centerpiece of British policy that Britain would withhold representative institutions to Palestine for as long as there was an Arab majority. On the first anniversary of the Balfour Declaration, November the 2nd, 1918, T. Lawrence, then Colonel Lawrence, t told a British Jewish newspaper, speaking entirely as a non-Jew, I look on the Jews as the natural importers of Western leaven so necessary for the countries of the Near East. Holding the views he did, and remembering the tremendous impression which de Gagne and the other Jewish villages in the Galilee had made on him ten years earlier. Lawrence found himself in December 1918, a month after the end of the First World War, securing an agreement between the leader of the Arab revolt against the Turks, Emir Faisal, and Chaim Weizmann, then president of the British Zionist Federation. The meeting between Faisal and Weizmann was held in London at the Carlton Hotel, later to be destroyed in the Blitz. And at this meeting, Lawrence acted as interpreter. Weizmann assured Faisal that the Zionists in Palestine would, as Weizmann put it, carry out public works of a far-reaching character so that the country could be so improved that it would have room for four or five million Jews without encroaching on the ownership rights of the Arab peasantry. On the 3rd of January 1919, Weizmann and Faisal reached an agreement Article 4 of their agreement declared that all necessary measures shall be taken to encourage and stimulate immigration of Jews into Palestine on a large scale and as quickly as possible to settle Jewish immigrants on the land through closer settlement and intensive cultivation of the soil. In taking such measures, Faisal and Weizmann agreed the Arab peasant and tenant farmers shall be protected in their rights and shall be assisted in forwarding their economic development. This was, of course, Lawrence's dream that the Jews would be, as he put it, the leaven that would build the Arab Middle East up to something more modern and prosperous. Two months later, on the 27th of February, 1919, at the Allied Supreme Council in Paris, and in the presence of Balfour, Chaim Weizmann presented the essence of the Weizmann-Faisal Agreement to the Allied Supreme Council, telling them that the nation that would receive Palestine as a League of Nations mandate must first of all, and this was the joint Weizmann-Faisal phraseology, promote Jewish immigration and close settlement on the land. During the discussion, 
the American Secretary of State, Robert Lansing, who was critical of the concept of a Jewish homeland, asked Weizmann critically and rather hostilely, did the words Jewish national home mean an autonomous Jewish government? It's interesting that Weizmann, who was the consummate diplomat and who sensed a deep American hostility to the Jewish national home, assured Lansing that this was not the case. The Jews did not want an autonomous Jewish government, but merely to establish in Palestine, under a mandatory power, an administration not necessarily Jewish, which would render it possible to send into Palestine 70 to 80,000 Jews annually. The Supreme Council pressed Weizmann and wanted to know if such a nationality as he envisaged here would eventually involve statehood. Weizmann told them later on when the Jews formed the large majority they would be right to, ripe to establish such a government as would answer to the state of the development of the country and to their ideals. It's difficult looking back from the present time to realize how much Weizmann was encouraged in his pursuit of the Zionist goal by his principal Arab interlocutor, the Emir Faisal. While Weizmann, as head of the Zionist delegation of the Paris Peace Conference, and Faisal, as head of the Hejazian delegation, were both together in Paris, encouraged to do so, both by Weizmann and by Lawrence, who was still there, not in the background, but in the foreground, Faisal wrote to Felix Frankfurter, one of the Zionist delegates at the Paris Peace Conference, and his letter on the 3rd of March, 1919, marks a high point in the close relationship between the two national movements, the Jewish and the Arab. Faisal, who described himself in his letter as king of Syria and Iraq, both of which countries he hoped soon to rule, wrote his letter at a time when his father, Emir Hussein of the Hejaz, was in the process of negotiating with Lawrence, giving up his family's claim to Palestine. This is what Faisal wrote. We feel that the Arabs and Jews are cousins in having suffered similar oppressions at the hands of powers stronger than themselves. And by a happy coincidence, we have been able to take the first steps towards the attainment of our national ideals together. We Arabs, especially the educated among us, look with the deepest sympathy on the Zionist movement. People less informed and less responsible than our leaders and yours, ignoring the need for cooperation of the Arabs and the Zionists, have been trying to exploit the local difficulties that must necessarily arise in Palestine in the early stages of our movement. I wish to give you my firm conviction that these differences are not on questions of principle, but on matters of detail such as must inevitably occur in every contact of neighboring peoples and are easily adjusted by mutual goodwill Indeed, nearly all of them will disappear with fuller knowledge. The British government, then led by David Lloyd George, who had become Prime Minister at one of the worst moments of the war in December 1916, 
and who had been a strong supporter of what he saw as Jewish national aspirations, legitimate Jewish national aspirations. Not only encouraged the weizmann faisal agreements, but actively supported them, both with regard to Jewish immigration and land purchase. On the 19th of June, 1919, the senior British military officer in Palestine asked for approval of an ordinance to reopen Jewish land purchase. Zionist interests, he stated, will be fully safeguarded. When the general's telegram was forwarded to Balfour, Balfour replied that land purchase could indeed be resumed, I quote, provided that, as far as possible, preferential treatment is given to Zionist interests. Just as Robert Lansing, the American Secretary of State, had made things awkward for Weizmann in Paris, so in August 1919, the Zionist plans that had been thus endorsed by Faisal and Balfour were challenged by a United States Commission of Inquiry, the King Crane Commission appointed by President Woodrow Wilson. It published its report on the 28th of August 1919 and was critical of Zionist ambitions, recommending, as it put it, serious modifications of the extremist Zionist program for Palestine, of unlimited immigration of Jews, looking finally to making Palestine distinctly a Jewish state. The King Crane permission went on to state that the Zionists with whom it had spoken looked forward, as it put it, to a practically complete dispossession of the present non-Jewish population. And in conclusion, the commissioners felt bound to recommend that only a greatly reduced Zionist program be attempted. That would mean that Jewish immigration should be definitely limited and that the prospect for making Palestine a Jewish state should definitely be given up. In this view, the United States was in a minority at the Supreme Council. And a week after the King Crane Commission published its devastating report, the Zionists received unexpected endorsement from the Times of London, which declared, our duty as a mandatory power will be to make Jewish Palestine not a struggling state, but one that is capable of vigorous and independent national life. In London, the Secretary of State for War, Winston Churchill, who then had responsibility for Palestine, published an article in one of the large circulation Sunday newspapers entitled Zionism versus Bolshevism, the struggle for the soul of the Jewish people, in which he argued that Zionism offered the Jews what he called a national idea of a commanding character. And he went on to say, if as may well happen, there should be created in our own lifetime by the banks of the Jordan a Jewish state which might comprise three or four millions of Jews. An event will have occurred in the history of the world which would from every point of view be beneficial. It was on the 24th of April 1920 at San Remo that the British Prime Minister David Lloyd George accepted 
a British mandate for Palestine and agreed that Britain as the mandatory power would be responsible for giving effect to the Balfour Declaration. I found in a little uh, tiny pencil diary kept by the British Chief of the Imperial General Staff, Field Marshal Sir Henry Wilson, who was at San Remo, a little note which states that there had been a two-hour battle among the French and British delegates, quote, about acknowledging and establishing Zionism as a separate state in Palestine. In January 1921, Lloyd George appointed Churchill to be Secretary of State for the Colonies, charged with drawing up the terms of the mandate and presenting them to the League of Nations. The first stage of Churchill's work was an agreement reached between T. Lawrence and the M. L. Faisal. Lawrence reporting to Churchill on the 17th of January 1921 that the M. L. Faisal, I quote, has agreed to abandon all of his father's claims to Palestine. What Faisal wanted in return since France had ejected him from Syria, was a kingdom for himself in Iraq, which was then also under British military and imminent mandatory control, and a kingdom for his brother, Abdullah, east of the River Jordan. With Faisal giving up the Hashemite claim to Palestine from the Mediterranean to the River Jordan, Churchill decided that the Arab majority in Palestine, what was then known as Western Palestine, would not be allowed representative institutions as they would use them to prevent a Jewish majority ever coming into place. Representative institutions, effectively sovereignty, would thus be withheld from Palestine until such time as the Jews were in a majority. Churchill sent Lawrence to Transjordan to explain to Abdullah that the Jews were to be established in the lands between the Mediterranean and the Jordan, and that east of the Jordan, Abdullah, as the local ruler, must curb all anti-Zionist activity and agitation among his followers. There has, of course, been much controversy about the separation of the mandate into two parts. Churchill understood, as indeed did Weizmann, who still hoped to have a sliver of land between the River Jordan and the railway, the Hejaz Railway, but understood that there was no way in which a Jewish majority could be established over that vast area and that it was from the Mediterranean to the Jordan that the Jews wished to be sovereign. Major James de Rothschild, a leading British Jew and a member of the Zionist Commission, which took part in all these negotiations, understood that by preventing an automatic Arab majority in Western Palestine and giving Abdullah the eastern part of the mandate, Churchill had ensured the survival of a Jewish national home. 34 years later, after Churchill had spoken in Parliament of the achievements of the young state of Israel, Rothschild wrote to him, thanking him for the fact, as he put it, that in Jerusalem in 1921, you laid the foundation of the Jewish state by separating Abdullah's kingdom from the rest of Palestine. Without this much opposed prophetic foresight, there would not have been an Israel today. Churchill worked throughout 1921 and 22 to secure for the Jews the possibility of a future Jewish majority in Western Palestine, despite strong local Arab objections. At the Cairo conference, Churchill made it clear 
that the Jews must be allowed to enter Palestine without let or hindrance and to do so until such time as they could be a majority. From Cairo, he came here to Western Palestine and up to Jerusalem, where he was handed a petition from the Haifa Congress of Palestinian Arabs, which began, one, we refuse Jewish immigration to Palestine. Two, we energetically protest against the Balfour Declaration to the effect that our country should be made the Jewish national home. Churchill replied in rejecting the Haifa Palestinian Arab arguments, telling them it is manifestly right that the Jews who are scattered all over the world should have a national center and a national home. And where else could that be but in this land of Palestine, with which for more than 3,000 years they've been intimately and profoundly associated? It's interesting that after Churchill's visit, Arab violence in Jaffa against the Balfour Declaration and Jewish immigration led the first British High Commissioner here, Sir Herbert Samuel, a British Jew, to order an immediate suspension of Jewish immigration in order to appease Arab sentiment. This did not find favor with the colonial office. A telegram was dispatched to Samuel, the present agitation is engineered in the hope of frightening us out of our Zionist policy. We must firmly maintain law and order and make concessions on their merits and not under duress. When Churchill got back to London from Cairo and Jerusalem, he found a considerable pullulation of disagreement with regard to the attitude he had taken and the plans which he was evolving for the mandate. When, on the 22nd of June 1921, he explained the British position on Zionism at a meeting of the Imperial Cabinet, the Canadian Prime Minister, Arthur Meehan, asked him aggressively, does the meaning of a Jewish national home mean giving the Jews control of the government? To which Churchill replied, if in the course of many years they become a majority in the country, they naturally would take it over. And in the 12 months that followed, in devising the mandate terms, Churchill and his officials at the colonial office worked hard to ensure that the mandate would make it possible for a Jewish majority to come to pass. The parliament was divided and principally the conservative members but also many liberal members did not have any sympathy with Zionist aspirations. And in 1937, when the Royal Commission of Inquiry into Palestine, the Peel Commission, questioned Churchill in secret about what he had had in mind in 1921 and 22, he gave them the following answers. In answer to the question, what is the conception you formed of the Jewish national home, Churchill replied, the conception undoubtedly was that if over the, the absorptive capacity over a number of years, an increasing Jewish population, that population should not in any way be restricted from reaching a majority position. Churchill was then asked by the commissioners what arrangements will be made to safeguard the rights of the new minority, the Arab minority, to which he said, we committed ourselves to the idea that someday, somehow, far off in the future, subject to justice and economic convenience, 
there might well be a great Jewish state there numbered by millions, far exceeding the present inhabitants of the country. And to cut the Jews off from that would be wrong. Whether the Jews could form a majority, the sine qua non of statehood, was challenged publicly by Herbert Samuel in the summer of 1921 when he said the conditions of Palestine are such as not to permit anything in the nature of mass Jewish immigration. As a result of Samuel's statement, Balfour called Churchill and Lloyd George together and they agreed that by the declaration we always meant an eventual Jewish state. As happens in the British system, all issues relating to our then colonial policy and all issues relating to peace and war, as we saw in 2003 with regard to Iraq, have to be approved by the Parliament. And no amount of agreement in the Cabinet can bypass the fact that Parliament has to be the ultimate arbiter. And so, in June 1922, the British government issued a white paper, sometimes known as the Churchill White Paper, which Parliament had to debate and which Parliament had to agree. The White Paper stated, it is essential that the Jews should know that they are in Palestine of right and not on sufferance. That is the reason why it is necessary for the existence of the Jewish National Home to be internationally guaranteed and that it should be formally recognized to rest on historic foundations. To reinforce this concept of right and to enable the Zionists to have advantages in the development of Palestine, Churchill granted the Zionists a monopoly on the development of electoral power in Palestine. Much to the distress and protest of the Palestinian Arabs, he authorized a scheme drawn up by the Russian-born Jewish engineer Pinchas Rutenberg to harness the waters of the Jordan Valley. And in the Rutenberg concession, as it was known, the Zionists were given the right to expropriate land from the Arabs should it be required for the hydroelectric works, first on the Jordan and then on the Yarkon. The white paper was debated in the House of Lords on the 21st of June, 1922. And everything in it was attacked. The Balfour Pledge, the concept of an eventual Jewish majority, and the Rutenberg Monopoly. Old anti-Semitic stereotypes emerged during this debate. The Jews ruled the world. The Jews sought world domination. And when the debate was over, a majority of the peers voted against the white paper and against the mandate. And it's interesting that a lot of their anger in the debate was against the Rutenberg concession, against giving the Jews an unfair advantage over the Arabs by this monopoly. It fell to Churchill on the 4th of July, 1922, to try to persuade the House of Commons to reverse this vote. It was one of the most difficult 
speeches, one of the most difficult arguments of his career. To initial skepticism and several calls of dissent, he said that anyone who had visited Palestine recently, as he had done, I quote, must have seen how part of the desert has been converted into gardens and how material improvement has been effected as a result of this Jewish enterprise by the Arab population dwelling around. And he went on to say that apart from this agricultural work, this reclamation work, there are services which science can render and of all the enterprises of importance which would have the effect of greatly enriching the land, none was greater than the scientific storage and regulation of the waters of the Jordan for the provision of cheap power and light needed for the industry of Palestine, as well as water for irrigation of lands now desolate. The Rutenberg Concession, Churchill said, offered all the inhabitants of Palestine the assurance of a greater prosperity and the means of a higher economic and social life. Churchill then asked Parliament that it should allow for government, I quote, to use Jews and to use Jews freely to develop new sources of wealth in Palestine. It was also imperative, he said, if the Balfour Declaration's pledges to the Zionists were to be carried out, that the House of Commons must reverse the vote of the House of Lords. Churchill's appeal was successful. The House of Commons voted in favor and the way was clear for Britain to present the terms of the mandate to the League of Nations. On the day after the House of Commons vote, Churchill telegraphed to Sir Wyndham Deeds, who was administering the government of Palestine in Samuel's absence, every effort will be made to get terms of mandate approved by Council of the League of Nations at forthcoming meeting. Those terms were approved on the 22nd of July 1922. Article 2 of the mandate instructed the mandatory power of Britain to secure the development of self-governing institutions. And in a note to the United States government, which still felt that these self-governing institutions should be Arabs, since the Arabs were such a considerable majority still, the British government explained that so far as Palestine is concerned, Article 2 of the mandate expressly provides that the administration may arrange with the Jewish agency to develop any of the natural resources of the country in order that the policy of establishing in Palestine a national home for the Jewish people could be successfully carried out, it is essential to guarantee Jewish facilities for developing the natural resources of the country. Article 4 of the mandate recognized the Zionist organization as the appropriate Jewish agency to work with the British government to secure the cooperation of the Jews in assisting in the establishment of a Jewish national home. Article 6 instructed the Palestine administration to facilitate Jewish immigration and encourage close settlement by the Jews on the land, including state lands and waste lands. That evening, Eliezer ben Yehuda went to see his friend Arthur Rupin in Ethiopia Street in Jerusalem. It was more than 40 years since Rupin had come to live in Palestine. He had just seen the telegram announcing that the League of Nations had confirmed Britain's Palestine mandate. Arthur Rupin recorded in his diary the Ben Yehudas are elated. Ben Yehuda telling me, Akshav anachnu be'atzeinu. Now we are in our country. Rupin himself was hesitant. And I will end with his words. I could not share the Ben Yehuda's enthusiasm. One is not allocated a fatherland 
by means of diplomatic resolutions. If we do not acquire Palestine economically by means of work, and if we do not win the friendship of the Arabs, our position under the mandate will be no better than it was before. Thank you. I'm sure you'll all agree that that was a real tour de force, and thank you very, very much, Martin. Um, I, I should note that I think Sir Martin's career is a great inspiration to students uh, studying in the humanities and the social sciences. It really is. And um, on that note, thank you once again from all of us for a magnificent lecture. And um, thanks.